We are up to mitzvah number 125, and today we're going to do 125 and 126. And again, we are in the book of Leviticus, so the subject matter is sacrifices and the various different laws related to sacrifices. Now, I must warn you, I am in Jerusalem right now, and I'm recording from my brother's computer, and the audio is a little bit suspect, I am sure. So if it doesn't sound great, I apologize. This is the best I could do. I worked really hard to find a better place, but uh, alas, it was hard to it was hard to find it. Now these two prohibitions, one twenty five and one twenty six, they relate to a meal offering, specifically a meal sin offering, and these two prohibitions relate to differences between the meal offering of a sinner and all the other meal offerings, and that is that unlike Typical meal offerings, you would not pour any oil or add any frankincense to the meal offering when it is a meal offering of a sin offering. Now, what exactly is oil? We know it's olive oil. But what is frankincense? So I saw a very nice uh, definition in the art scroll. It says that frankincense is a resinous substance deriving from the sap of certain trees, which hardens into granules, and those are burned as incense. So typically a meal offering would have that as well. And when it comes to a sin offering that is of the meal variety, this is omitted. Now, we spoke a few times ago about the idea of a variable sin sacrifice. Depending on a person's wealth, that will determine the kind of offering that they bring. And a pauper, a really poor person, will bring a meal offering as their version of a variable sin sacrifice. And this is the only instance where a meal offering would be a sin uh, of the sin variety. So you'd have a meal offering that's a sin sacrifice. A rich person would never bring a meal offering as a sin sacrifice. And we have two mitzvos that relate to the differences between this meal offering and all other meal offerings. It omits oil and frankincense. All other mincha offerings, all other meal offerings, it has oil and frankincense besides for this one. And that's mitzvah number 125, to omit oil from a meal offering of a sinner, and 126, to omit frankincense from a meal offering of a sinner. And as is true with many of these mitzvahs in the book of Leviticus, the whole subject is so mysterious to us, you know, we've never really witnessed a sacrifice not an animal sacrifice, not a bird sacrifice, not a meal offering. The whole thing is very theoretical and abstract for us. But nevertheless, we're trying to bring it down to our level. And even in a mitzvah that we don't really have the opportunity to fulfill, when we study it and we see the reasons for it, or at least the reasons that are offered by the Sefer Chinuch, we can deduce from it perhaps some nice lessons that are applicable to our lives. And the Sefer Chinuch, he offers two beautiful reasons for this mitzvah. He notes that both oil and frankincense, these are items of stature and greatness. It's no coincidence, says the Sefer Chinuch, that if you mix oil with any other liquid, the oil floats to the top. And the reason why it floats to the top, of course, that's the way the Almighty made it. But it's because it connotes a degree of stature and greatness and distinction. And it's well known, says the Sefer Chinuch, that good oil is very prestigious. And he mentions that we're told in the book of Exodus, we just read it last week, that Moshe is required to make special anointing oil, you mix it with a few other spices, and this cannot be replicated, and this is the special oil that you use to anoint Aaron and his sons and their garments and the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and all of its vessels and all of its beams, and in the future, when someone becomes a Kohen Gadol, when someone becomes a high priest, they use the same vial, the same flask of oil that Moshe arranged, that Moshe made. And a king likewise is anointed with that same oil. Why 
Do you use oil? Because someone who ascends to greatness, someone who's given a, a distinction and stature and nobility and elevated above their peers, the way you symbolize that is with oil. And therefore, if you have a sinner, what is the proper posture of a sinner? What is a sinner supposed to think about? What is the method through which they achieve atonement? The method is by humility, by recognizing that you made a mistake, by feeling sorry and even a little broken about what you did because you went against the will of the Almighty. And therefore, it's inappropriate to take these very expensive and prestigious things like oil and frankincense that has no place in the world of the sinner because the objective of the sinner is to achieve repentance. And part of the way you do that is to feel sorry and regretful about what you did and to recognize that the choices that you made actually don't elevate you. They demote you. They bring you down. It's interesting. Our saints tell us that the anointing oil that's poured on Aaron and the high priests and the vessels and the beams and all the elements of the tabernacle, it really has two functions. Of course, oil indicates greatness. It indicates a certain stature, a certain designation. But even someone who is not necessarily exhibiting greatness, when you pour oil on them, that experience of being anointed, that confers greatness in a place where maybe it wasn't present prior. The experience of taking someone and taking the special oil and pouring it on their head, that bestows greatness upon the recipient of that anointment. And the idea is that really all of us, we all have incredible greatness within us, but sometimes we don't view ourselves as being worthy. When someone is anointed, they are reminded of the fact that really they have all that within them. They just need to unearth it. That experience or that kind of feeling, it's inappropriate for the sinner to have it. They have to be in a posture of repentance and regret due to the transgression that they did. And therefore, reason number one says the Sefer Chinuch, this is perhaps a reason why this meal offering, the, the sin offering, that's a meal offering, it's a little bit different than all the other sin offerings. It's a little bit different than all the other meal offerings in that there's no oil, there's no frankincense. Idea number one. Idea number two is that who, who brings a meal offering? Which sinner brings a meal offering? Only a pauper. Only someone who is impoverished. They're poor for a reason. There's this old saying, it's really expensive to be poor. You've heard that term. It's expensive. Why? Because if you're poor, you're probably not paying up your credit cards every month. You're paying 20% interest. And there are all sorts of things that poor people can afford to make life cheaper. The Torah wants to go out of its way, says the Sefer Chinuch, to make life cheaper for poor people. And therefore, in order to not encumber the pauper, that they have to bring also oil, which is much more expensive, and also frankincense, which is likewise expensive, the Almighty does not want to encumber any creation. That's the words of the Sefer Chinuch. There's no creation of God that the Almighty wants to encumber, make their life difficult. And therefore, we have a pauper, and the Torah wants to accommodate this person and it's only going to ask them to bring a bit of flour. And everyone, says the Sefer HaKanach, everyone has a little bit of flour. That's not too much to ask. That's the basic building blocks of the human diet, a little bit of flour, and that is all that is asked of someone who does not have greater means. Now, how much flour is actually brought in a sin sacrifice of the meal variety? So the amount equals 43.2 eggs volume. 
in the Torah, it's hard to measure. There's no like centimeters and ounces and pounds. The way things were measured is with other existing items. So there's an olives volume and an edge volume and uh, the length of an arm. Even today we have vestiges of that, you know, the, a foot. What's a foot? It's um, 12 inches. Well, what's what's that? Why is it called a foot? It's called a foot because that's the length of a foot. Of course, some people have larger feet and some people have smaller feet, but it's a common thing to measure things uh, when you have other things to measure them against. So the Isaron, which is what the Torah says, how much is an Isaron? The Talmud tells us it's 43.2 eds volume. When that's translated to modern times, it's around five pounds of flour. And typically, when you bring a meal offering, you would bring that amount of flour. But you'd also bring a log of oil, which is six eds volume of oil, about a half a liter to simplify for us. And you'd bring a fistful of frankincense. In this mitzvah, we find that the meal offering of a sinner omits the load of oil and the fistful of frankincense. There's another interesting idea in the Talmud about this particular mitzvah and why the pauper who is bringing a meal offering as their sin sacrifice does not bring oil and frankincense. And that is when someone has a mitzvah to do, and they could do it right now, but not in the idealized way, in a suboptimal way. You don't wait until you have the ability to do the mitzvah in the most optimal way. So suppose you have an overachiever. You have someone who's climbing the ladder. They have upward mobility. And now they're poor, but they can foresee themselves. You know, they're going to get a raise soon. They're going to get a promotion soon. Something's going to come in soon. And you may think, you know what? I have to bring this sacrifice. And I want to bring a, a rich person's sacrifice. I don't have the money right now, but I'll wait a month or two or 10. And then I'll bring the sin offering and I'll do something much more substantial. Says the Talmud, no. If you have a mitzvah to do right now, and you could do it right now, even if it's not ideal, don't wait until later, which I, I found to be a very nice idea. I remember once I was uh, chatting with a friend of mine and we were considering to maybe study, study together. And I was dealing with a few other requirements, responsibilities. And I told him a line like, well, after that's done, then I'll get to our study session. And he, he rebuked me gently. He rebuked me gently. And he said, no, whenever you push it off, that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. We don't push off mitzvos. So yes, it'll be easier. It'll be better for you. It'll be, it'll, it'll be, you know, much more manageable then. But that's a that's what the Yitzhara wants you to do. You push it off. You know, we're on the cusp of the festival of, of Pesach. And Pesach and the matzah, it's all about speed. It's all about speed. The verse tells us, don't allow the matzah to become chametz. And the word matzah, and the word mitzvah spell the same way. Matzos, mitzvos, spell the same way. Says the Talmud, it's talking about matzah, of course. Don't let the matzah to become leavenized. The rise, don't wait. And yes, it's referring to matzah, but it's also referring to mitzvos. You have an opportunity to do a mitzvah? Don't allow 18 minutes to elapse. Because once that happens... It starts to ferment, it starts to bubble, and that bubble, that's the Eight Sahara. In fact, one of the nicknames of the Eight Sahara is Sa'ar Shabisa, the leaven in the bread. What's the leaven in the bread? That's the Eight Sahara. And symbolically, you have a mitzvah to do right now, you wait around, you delay, the Eight Sahara's coming, he's gonna join the party, and he's gonna do whatever he can to torpedo and destroy your mitzvah. This is mitzvah number 125 and 126. With sin offerings of the meal variety, you omit oil and frankincense. And again, this is another mitzvah that we have never witnessed, but we hope to witness it sometime in our lifetime. Uh, just two days ago, I got the great privilege and honor and fortune to go as close as we are allowed to go to the side of the temple. I went to the Kosel, to the uh, 
Western Wall. And I told my son, I said to him, we're here now. And it's a great privilege. And many of our ancestors would have given up a lot to just come here, to be in the proximity of the grounds of the temple. I told him, this is where Abraham was. This is where Isaac was offered as a sacrifice. This is where Jacob had his dream with the ladder and the angels going up and down. This is the place where Abraham walked. It's an unbelievable thing. This is where King David bought this land and King Solomon built his temple. We're right over here. And we hope, you know, it's still in ruins and we don't have a temple, but hopefully next time we're here, it will in fact be built. And I know that's something that our sages out, and I know that's something that we've been saying for many generations, but I said to maybe next time we're here, maybe next time there'll be a temple. And hopefully we hope that this will be the final generation before Messiah. And we will be able, in fact, to witness the temple in action Maybe we will witness these mitzvahs as well. 125, to omit oil from a meal offering of the sin variety. And 126, the same thing. When you have a sin offering of the meal variety, you don't put frankincense on it.